Hey, hello everybody. So it's seven o'clock, it's Thursday. We are back in studio. So um, most of you know that we uh, had to go out of town uh, rather abruptly last week. Um, unfortunately, Gay's mom passed away. So we flew to Ohio, or I'm sorry, Pennsylvania, to uh, um, be at her memorial service and, and uh, help officiate that and sing, Gay sang. And so, but we are back. We arrived back in LA area on, um, uh, what day was that, Monday? Yeah, Correct. Monday. Monday. <laughs> I don't even know what day it is, but we are here. It is Thursday night. I know that. It is 7 p.m. and you are in our Bible discovery group, our exclaimed dot live. No, nope. live dot exclaimed. Yeah. Something like that. Anyway. Or exclaimed dot TV or, you know, right. there's a few different uh, versions. So. It is our uh, Thursday night Exodus study and tonight we are going to be covering chapter 19 so thanks for joining us let us know you're out there um, we have a few places that we have to look so if we're kind of looking around everywhere it's uh, we're using a couple of different screens tonight uh, from normal so uh, just let us know you're out there and we will we will uh, work our way through Exodus 19 so uh, you ready doc yeah it's not showing up on my Facebook feed yet. So. Oh, okay. Um, I have it on Facebook, Bible Discovery. I know. Well, so. We need to have it up here so we can see comments. Okay. So, so I don't know how to give refresh it. Give us a it. second to... I don't know how to refresh um, it because it's a Mac, not a... Give us a second to, to get this up and going on so we can see what we're doing. But How do I, you refresh it so, if it's a Mac? Um, I do not know. So... We shall see. There you go. And there it is down there. Got it. Woohoo! Just don't know how to scroll on these things. There we go. Hey, Catherine's see, there. And Robin's you. there. So you should and, go ahead and like and share. And Polly's there. I see somebody shared. Right. And Angie's here. So thank you all for joining us. Texas. All right. So right now we have uh, Ohio, Southern California, or, well, L.A. area. We have um, uh, t t Texas, and we have Temecula. Temecula. All tuning in. Thank so you all so much for joining us. That's the refresh us. button, that little tiny arrow up here on gotcha. the right-hand corner, and it takes gotcha. twice as long. Okay. <laughs> so as, um, a, as a PC. All right. Well, I don't want to have the PC map. No, no, I'm tonight, just saying. So. I'm just saying it's different, so, so I don't know. So if you don't are ready, Get if you are ready, if you would open your... Bibles or your apps or whatever you have to Exodus chapter four, 19, chapter 19. So uh, we are going to go ahead and get started and um, recall that uh, when we last talked that um, Moses was leading the Israelites into the pr promised land and he was, uh, God was instructing them on uh, and, and performing miracles for them and, and uh, um, uh, providing for their, their needs. Again, we're talking a couple million people in a very uh, hospitable, inhospitable uh, uh, locale, and God is miraculously providing for their basic necessities. Now, tonight, chapter 19, we are going to see how God is um, uh, he's instructing the people um, as to his holiness. He's, he's teaching the people about himself. And uh, hey, Rich, thanks for joining us. Many people think, wow, God is so harsh. He is so harsh and he is so demanding here. But again, we have to recall that, that for 400 years, these people have been um, exposed to uh, a myriad of pagan gods, a myriad of, of cultic rituals and uh, God has done all kinds of, or their, their little g gods have been um, absolute monsters in some cases. And now, now the God of the Bible, Yahweh, our God, is instructing them as to who he is. And he's making it very clear. He's not a God made of stone. He's not a God made of wood. He's not a God that requires 
bizarre rituals. He's a God who demands holiness. And so that's what we're going to see tonight. And um, we'll go ahead and jump right in. And verse 1 of chapter 19. Um, so verse 1 says, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt on that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So, so it's been three months now. They've been wandering in the desert for three months. God has been with them every step of the way. We have the pillar of, of fire by night, the, cloud of, the pillar of cloud by day. He's guiding them. He's provided food for them every single day. We're going to move it over to he's the... He's provided water for them. Um, in, in, again, in a very, very arid region, he's provided uh, uh, meat for them on occasion. Uh, he's parted the Red Sea for them. He's destroyed enemies for them. He's uh, shown them to be victorious over unprovoked attacks. And three months here, and now they are arriving at uh, the Sinai, the Mount Sinai. And we're going to spend a little time talking about them. It's been, it's been a pretty exciting three months for them, I would say, right? So, and he's undoing 400 years of oppression and slavery and... Uh, exposure to uh, a lot of really bad stuff. Um, so it's the verse said that, that they're in the wilderness of the Sinai. And, and in the next couple of slides, we're going to explore that a huge, 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 huge controversy as to where exactly were they. Um, and and there are, the people who are in one camp are so adamant that they are correct People that are in another camp are so adamant that they are correct. Camp, no pun intended. Yeah, no pun intended. Israelites are in camp. Yeah, you caught that, huh? 40 years. <laughs> yeah. So, do you want to make that screen bigger? Yeah, we're going to make that screen bigger. Do you bigger. want to? Yeah. So, a couple of things. We're going to go ahead and... Uh, arrow back. There it is. There it is. Ta-da! Let you feast on that for a little bit. So, um, the commentator Cole says that we have to understand that when it, it talks about wilderness, a lot of people, and they hear Sinai wilderness, um, we've all been exposed to National Geographic, we've all been exposed to uh, uh, images of, in, in movies and stuff of this vast, empty, sand-filled uh, region. And, and uh, wilderness here uh, is more akin to like if you've ever driven from LA to Phoenix, um, it's very sparse and it's very dry and it's very, hot but if you stop and you, or if you actually look out in the surrounding area you see that there's actually no they can't see you right now right? Uh, you, you can't see me right now but you can hear my voice <laughs> yeah. there's a significant amount of uh vegetation and uh, 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 uh things going on so uh this map shows that what is currently the sinai peninsula and that's a geopolitical uh, uh rendering of this of this geographical area and what we call the Sinai Peninsula may or may not be uh, what uh, is being referred to as the Sinai here in in Exodus so we can go back to the split screen I think so here we go ta-da and we're back so 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 we're at least if if you've been paying any attention to world events uh, we're uh, vaguely familiar with the Sinai Peninsula being between Egypt and Saudi Arabia, and a very inhospitable place. And indeed, indeed, it, it, it is a very difficult place, but uh, it is uh, wilderness in the sense that it is a uh, sparse region, not, a, not a, just a sandbox. Okay, uh, next slide. Verse 2. When they set out from Rephidium... They came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. And there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Okay, and this is where things start getting a little crazy with the commentators because uh, we know where Rephidium is, or we have a pretty good idea of, it, of where it is. It is is in the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. But then things start getting a little crazy in the sense that there are multiple mountain ranges in that region of the world. And there are multiple uh, mountains. And when I say mountains, um, don't, don't think Grand Tetons think uh, of, of mountains more like what we're used to here in Southern California. Um, but 
there are arguments for for each quote unquote Mount Sinai there are arguments that hold water in each case so but if you know when Moses had his burning bush experience right. he was in the land of Midian right so it's and God said that is that was Mount Sinai. Right. That is the mountain right. that he was going to bring the Israelites back to. Right. So that is the same location. So, I mean, the Sinai Peninsula that's on the map is not in the land of Midian. Correct. And so, we're going to talk about that in just so a second. So that's where I'm like, well, I don't really think, I think that, you know, if you look at what Scripture really says, yeah. there's a lot of... Um, validity and it being over in the in land Saudi of Midian Arabia. in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, even though that's called the Sinai Peninsula, Peninsula, that's not the land of Midian. Right. And so we're going to talk about that in exactly two seconds. So, okay. So, hey, Brian, thanks for joining us. So, so several commentators, uh, several very um, uh, scholarly commentators have noted what Gabe was just mentioning, that Moses knew where Mount Sinai was. He'd been there already. Yeah. He knew where they he was going. They weren't wandering, and then God said, oh, hey, stop at this mountain. Hey, you see that peak over it, there? Go he, there. He Go. knew where they were going. Yeah, Moses God knew said. where they were going. Right. Okay, the other peoples did not necessarily know where they were going, but Moses did. He had been there already. Right. Okay. And just as Gay said, so, but let's explore that. Um, so one commentator, or, or one, one summary, I should say, put it this way. According to Exodus 2, Exodus 3, a couple places in Exodus 3, the mountain region was in the area of Midian, the land of Midian, right. which is east, uh, uh, east of the Gulf of Aqaba, okay, and right. east of the, what's the modern Sinai Peninsula. The ancient land of Midia, Midian is the modern nation of Saudi Arabia. In Galatians 4.25, the Apostle Paul clearly describes Mount Sinai as being in modern-day Saudi Arabia. There is significant evidence, both historic and archaeological, to associate the Arabian mountain uh, Jebel al-Laz with the site of Mount Sinai. And, and uh, that's, that's sort of based on all the research that we were doing over this, this past week or two that's sort of where i think gay and i are kind of settling is that we know that we all have those maps in the back of our bible and it sort of puts uh, a mount sinai square in the the bottom of uh, the sinai peninsula but that may in fact not be true based on the most recent my bible is 40 years old so in the 40 years hence or 50 years old actually well 40 so in the in the in the forty years since my Bible was published, uh, there has been a significant amount of, of of archaeological evidence indicating that that the land of Midian is indeed in Saudi Arabia. But the current political situation is such is that archaeologists and other researchers cannot get there. Again, keep in mind Saudi Arabia is a strongly Muslim country. Mm. They don't want. Christian investigators in their land. They just don't. So there's that, that whole plethora of uh, modern uh, uh, problems encountered. But there's a good body of evidence indicating that um, Mount, the real Mount Sinai may in fact be in Saudi Arabia. Miss Carolyn joined us. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks for joining us. So looking at an updated map, so we'll go ahead and toss that up there. There we are. Give us a second as we navigate this. So they can see your arrow if you move it slowly Here's enough. my arrow. If you move it slowly. So traditionally, uh, Mount Sinai is located or, or has been said to be located right about the center of your screen. As you can see here on the live shot that you can move see your arrow. Yeah. Oh, you can see my arrow moving. Look at that. Yeah. But more modern research tends to indicate that if you look at about the four o'clock position, you see Mount Sinai being over in Saudi Arabia and it, by its um, uh, Arabic name, Jebel al-Laz. Okay, I believe I'm saying that correctly. So nonetheless, as Gay, as Gay so astutely pointed out, 
Moses knew where he was going. <laughs> yeah, so if you read, I mean, what the beginning of Exodus says and how it describes Moses going into the wilderness and into the onto Mount Sinai in the land of Midian, mm -hmm. doesn't make really sense to me that it's not in the land of Midian. And then when the Apostle Paul says it's in Mount Sinai of Moses was in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. um, it feels like scripture saying that's where it is. Yeah. It's not just because we call the we call the other area the Sinai right. Peninsula doesn't mean that's the mountain. Right. That that's not how it's described in scripture at all. So. Right. And so some people argue it's like well uh, well some people um, um, in a negative fashion say oh look the scriptures don't even know you know it's all made up because nobody can it's contradictory. It's contradictory. Nobody, can nobody agree. knows the, the mm -hmm. but. The more I was praying about it and thinking about it, the more I was like, you know what? God, you know how people are. If people um, know where something is, they tend to make that into a modern day idol. Right. We already see it. We see it in so many places. People will pay pilgrimages to these places and then utterly destroy these locations. And God doesn't want people to be focused on the dirt. Well, or even not destroy the locations, but they'll end up worshiping. At the location, at yeah. At the location and worshiping the ground there, the dirt there. People will be selling bits and pieces of the mountain because this is yes. Moses' holy mountain, you know, so. I mean, I we, mean, we already see it with people that claim to have a splinter of the original cross that Jesus was hung on. Oh my goodness, around Easter time, so many places cart out I'm these go back to splinters the, of wood. They're oh, looking yeah. at the map. There we go. Let's get us back here on the screen. I can't find out how to do it again. So there we are. And ta-da! We're back! There so, we go. Yeah, so many pe place people uh, are shown a splinter of wood, and it's claimed to have been the original cross that Jesus hung on, um, and people just absolutely... Uh, uh, almost worship that splinter of wood, you know, and, and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense because Jesus was hung as a criminal and and people wouldn't have known to, people wouldn't have been uh, uh, seeking souvenirs. Mm -hmm. um, if anything, they would, have, they would have been repulsed by this torture device. Right. Nonetheless, we know that people will, will uh, Paul encountered the same thing when people were stealing his handkerchiefs later on when he was working and he would wipe the sweat from his brow and put his handkerchief down people were stealing it and then trying to claim it as some kind of a talisman or, or, or uh, uh, icon you mm -hmm. know and so so I think that partly explains the controversy about like why we don't know exactly where Mount Sinai is I mean you know there's already tourist stands and and you know, shysters, you know, conducting tours at the real Mount Sinai and, and all this nonsense. So, right. So, yeah. So nonetheless. Well, I mean, I think we know where it is, but like you said, no one can really get there to verify it right. archaeologically or to visit that site. So the other area is more open. And so people are going to claim that's right. the correct area. But the way it's described in scripture, it's got to be somewhere in the modern day Arabia. Right. That's what the Apostle Paul said it, you know, just thinking. He's pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> he had we this, might want to go with that. He had this person to, coaching him called the Holy Spirit. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then Moses, you know, it's written down in Exodus like a couple times, yeah, you know, yeah. that Verse, it's in the land of Midian. So I'm thinking it's in the land of Midian. Yeah. Verse three. Verse three. And Moses went up to God and the Lord called him from the mountain saying, this is what you shall say to the house of Jacob. And tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Again, this should be obvious. These people have, have seen so many miracles and they've seen God provide in so many uh, remarkable ways that we're still talking about it uh, some 3,000 years later. Yet... Yet, as we'll see, as we progress through the book of Exodus, we'll see how quickly they forget. So God is instructing Moses, and he's saying, you're going to instruct these people now, and you're going to remind them, again, what I've 
done and what I'm, I'm continuing to do. Well, and so the analogy is just an important analogy about eagle's wings oh, yes. right here. Um, because um, the commentators I was listening to and reading said that um, like eagles are somewhat different. They're birds of prey for one thing. So they're very big and they're very strong, um, of course. Um, and But the way they help their young sort of learn to fly and assist their young is that a lot of other species of birds actually like carry their young like in their talons. They grab them and, you know, take them, pick them up and put them back in the nest or something like that. But eagles actually get underneath their young or have the young ride on their mm -hmm. back. They do, and that's true. And they have the young hold on to them on their back. And it, so they true. literally are protecting them. So if there was, um, you know, someone shooting at a, an eagle, because the young is on the back, the um, the parent eagle would actually, like the arrow would have to penetrate the adult first in order to harm the baby. Yeah. And so it's a cool analogy because it's God is analogy. saying, I carried you this way. Yeah. I carried you um, like eagles carry their young and therefore I've been protecting you this and I will continue. But you got to remember how I carried you, how I yeah. protected you. I mean, the Israelites did nothing to get themselves out of Egypt, out of bondage, right? right? I mean, it was all God's provision, God's protection. Um, and this whole journey has been in part so God can, they can become familiar with God mm -hmm. and remember as a people, I mean, they were in captivity for 400 years. So for many generations, they didn't have a close relationship with the Lord. I mean, they might've seen personal miracles and provision, you know, over the years, but um, they certainly didn't have a lot of interaction, put it that way. Right. Um, but now that God has freed them and the way he freed them, like that's what the whole plagues were about. All the plagues weren't, they didn't need so many because, well, because Pharaoh was so dense. I mean, God could have released them at any time, but he did it the way he did it. So they would see his abilities and they would see who he is and they would learn who he is you know and how right. he's protecting them so that the eagle's wings analogy there i mean there's great songs with, about eagle's wings you know praise songs one by hill song you know titled eagle's wings so if you haven't heard that in a while look it up on youtube and listen to it but um i keep thinking about that one during my study for yeah. this week <laughs> it's a it's a beautiful beautiful mm -hmm. verse especially if you understand what what gay was just explaining I mean, she's being gracious. A lot of a lot of birds just, you know, it's like time to hit the road. Boom, they push their their young one out of the nest. <laughs> well, and you guys have done that like you've seen, oh, there's a little baby bird just floundering around in the yeah. bushes or somewhere and then a cat gets it or, yeah. you know, something gets it and if people find it, they go, "Oh no, I can't touch it." And that's right. not actually true, just so you know. That's an urban myth or whatever, right. uh, wildlife myth. Yeah, you know, yeah. if you touch the baby bird, the mom won't come back. It's totally not true. So if you find a baby bird, just Put them up in a safe area. If you can find the nest, obviously put it back in the nest. If not, you can use like a little box or make a little fake nest, you know, of your own. But put them up somewhere high so predators can't get to them. Exactly. And the mama bird or, or daddy bird, they will come back and take care of it. They will. So verse... Because I know you guys are going to ask me that. So. Yep. Verse 5, <laughs> verse 5. And this is kind of the crux of tonight. This is kind of the crux that we want to make sure that everybody gets so to speak that's why they're Cause, big cause, yellow arrows yeah. so yeah <laughs> hence the big arrows right big yellow arrows verse five verse five now then if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples for all the earth is mine this is it this mm -hmm. is it this is what god is trying to instruct the people um that this is a relationship right he is inviting the Hebrew peoples to enter into this unique relationship, this covenant relationship, this protected, honored, uh, mutual relationship. This is the crux of it. So uh, uh, yes, he's God, he is holy, but this holy God is saying, obey my voice, keep my covenant, and you will be my own possession. And that's such a beautiful phrase there, right. my own possession. Let's see what I said. Yeah, the commentator Wilson, uh, he, he he noted it's it's translated in some versions as treasured possession. Yeah, as you say, the NLT says, and verse 5 says, 
Now if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure yep. from among all the peoples on the earth, for all the earth belongs to me. So I like that, special treasure. Peculiar treasure, peculiar meaning meaning like unique, uh, See? personal possession. See, it's good to be peculiar. Yeah. That means personal I'm God's possession. special treasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, 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 it's the, the word, I think it's called seguele, the, the, the single word there is translated, it has this meaning every single time. It's the image of, of it's not just uh, 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 something that you admire from afar, like the, the Statue of Liberty, be, or, or, yeah, the Statue of Liberty is uh, a treasured possession for the people of the United States. We treasure that, we see that. Something within us says that that is a representative of, of, of who we are as, a, as an ideal of who we are as an American people. But here it's like, no, you, God is saying, you are my treasured possession. You are mine. Mm -hmm. You are mine. Um, uh, a loose analogy would be a, a wedding ring or something like that. that that's yours. Right, that, a that, treasured possession. Yeah. Something dear that you hold right dear. that has significance and is indicative but it's of an relationship. intimate possession an intimate it's not possession. just something like you like you said like the statue of liberty where right. like as a country we we revere the the, the american right. flag you know that's something that we all hold dear right. but that's not the same thing as an intimate um, yeah it's treasure. that one thing that if your house caught on fire that you would want to make sure you, you grab, grabbed yeah. mm -hmm. that you grabbed and you took with you it's that it's that type of sense and then maybe it's your kids i mean i hope it's your kids i know it's your kids okay i'm just kidding but but that idea yeah it depends on the that kid. idea right hey joji Joji's Hi, Joji and caroline yeah caroline yeah, yeah so so that's 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 so this is such a beautiful passage god is inviting the hebrew people listen to me enter in my covenant into a covenant with me and you will be my possession my treasured possession Unlike any uh, thing else that you've ever encountered or uh, anyone else in the world, for that matter, has encountered. He reiterates this in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 14.2, he says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the people on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Right. Later on in Deuteronomy, and the Lord 26, the Lord has declared this day that you are his people his treasured possession as he promised and that you are to keep all his commands there are stipulations to that okay lest we think that this is only an old testament thing uh in in, in psalms in psalms in psalms which is old testament in which in is psalms old testament. 135 he says for the lord has chosen jacob to be his own israel to be his treasured possession mm. okay however new testament new testament it didn't just die with the Old Testament time. It didn't just, just that, that promise didn't extinguish. It was expanded to include all believers and followers of Jesus Christ. You and I, you and gay, okay? Titus uh, 2, 13 uh, and, and 14. Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good that's us that's us when we declare jesus christ as our lord and savior we become his special possession and then in first peter 2 9 uh we're reminded again peter tells us you us are a chosen people a royal priesthood a holy nation a people belonging to god that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Now again, we know God owns it all. That he owns the cattle on a hundred hills. We know everything is his, but this is the idea of a special intimacy. We are his, indeed we are his, that he, he will not willingly let go of, and, and, and there will never be a time when he'll let go of us. We're his. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Verse six. Verse six. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So, so this is what God tells Moses. He's telling Moses, you're going to deliver this message. You're going to instruct the people that this is how I see you. 
if you enter into this covenant with me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what did I do? Whoops, I went backwards. Let me go this way. That's why I staple them. Yeah, that's why she staples them. I don't staple them because I make notes. Okay, and I get messy. You staple them. So, verse 7. Did you just read that? No. Verse 7. Verse 7. No. I lost it. So God's instructed. Oh, there it is. Yep. So God has been, or God has told Moses what to say when he re returns from the mountain to the people of Israel who are waiting down below. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. So Moses basically did, God said, go tell the people this. So Moses went down and told them. And, he, and he, he does exactly what God asks him to do. Now watch this. Now watch this. Oh, Robin has a question. Robin has a question. Uh, were the Israelites so jaded for 400 years of slavery that they just didn't get it? Yes. <laughs> Short answer is, is, is not just jaded. Jaded is perhaps... Uh, um, I, I think they were just more, more ignorant because yeah. you got to remember, you know, they knew like God had kept them separated as a people. Yeah. However, uh, of course, there were elders that, you know, knew and that oral history would have gotten uh, transferred mm -hmm. and the stories and accounts of who God was and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob like that would have been part of their culture. So they would have a knowledge, but they didn't have a experience. Right, right. So they weren't really jaded as they were just inexperienced. Yeah. Uh, knowing what does that mean? We are Hebrews. We are chosen by God. Now they're finding that out. Yeah. But they're finding it out day by day on this journey. Um, and so God's basically teaching them. And it, what's really cool is it applies to us today, you know, because we are all, you know, we are all given the opportunity to accept Christ's work on the cross, right? And therefore, then we are also his chosen people. We are the priesthood um, yeah. today. I mean, Israel is still special in God's eyes, but... We are still, since Christ died on the cross, we all have um, a lot of the same privileges now. Yeah. Joji that that says, only this country had. Does that make sense? Yeah. Joji says we are in his, his inheritance. Yeah. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. So it's not so much. Oh, and then Joji said God showered them with real favors and therefore required real obedience. Absolutely. It, well, and, and even today, I mean, God's not a genie. He doesn't just give right. us what we want. He don't, we, we don't just say, oh, God, I need this or I want this. I mean, God has our best interests in mind, and sometimes he, you know, he, al he always knows more than we do about the whole situation. So sometimes um, we don't get what we want, right? right. But it is what we need. So, um, but yes, you know, he did shower them and was showering them. And just as today, God requires obedience of us. Yeah. So, so they're unlearning 400 years of culture, okay, uh, 400 years of of foreign gods and 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 a, a completely different viewpoint right they were being and, exposed to all those other kind of gods yeah. and um so basically it was kind of like they were special they knew they were hebrews they knew they were israelites they knew they got you know their god was the god of abraham isaac and jacob but they didn't really know what that meant in reality yeah they didn't know how to walk in that they didn't know um you know that how did that make them special it was kind of a like a diluted version, you know, yeah. of faith for them, you know, probably had gotten diluted over the 400 years, like you said. One commentator that I was looking, looking at their materials was talking about how the wilderness experience really stripped them of all the trappings and trappings of, of, of life in Egypt. Um, day to day was just a survival. Mm -hmm. Everything else was stripped away. There were, there were no elegant palaces, no giant pyramids, no uh, a rich river delta. It was just God's provision, God's provision. Uh, I don't know that I haven't, in any of the things that I've read, I haven't seen any commentary yet, but I just realized that they were in the wilderness for 40 years and they were in Egypt for 400 years. Isn't that like a tenth? Yeah. A tenth of the time. Right. So God was, I'll have to look into that further. It's like a tithe. Yeah, a tithe is a tenth, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah exactly. After looking at, that just occurred to me. Right. So, so at this point is, what did it say? Three months from the day they yeah. left Egypt 
is where they're doing their first time of camping at the base of Mount Sinai. Right. They are going to remain at this camp for 11 months. Yeah. So, yeah. And so it's working. interesting because um, God really, you know, intended for this journey to be about a year. Yeah. But then the Israelites have a lot of issues with doubt and not, not disobedience, as we're going to get to. Um, and as a result of that, their one-year journey ends up lasting 40 years. Yeah. So I was listening to um, an interesting uh, presentation on YouTube. It's not specifically just this chapter, but it is about this part of the, b the scripture. And it was just interesting because the gentleman said, you know, we all will often have wilderness journeys, you know, yeah. throughout our life. There'll be times where we feel like, you know, God might be distant or we are just sort of in this strange period, like being wandering in the desert. But God isn't, those aren't just wasted times. And they're actually, they're times of preparation. They're times when God is preparing us for what he wants us to do at the end of that wilderness time, right? So they're actually times of preparation. Um, but if we are disobedient and and or one of the sins that gets listed later as to why the Israelites, many of them are not going to enter the promised land. One of the one of the sins on the list is complaining. Yeah. And so even complaining in our hearts, like complaining to God, like, you know, complaining a lot. I mean, we can ask questions. That's different than complaining and complaining to God. It's listed as a reason that they to, that God had to take a 12 month journey and turn it into a 40 year <laughs> journey. So this gentleman was just sharing, like, you know, I've had a couple of those seasons in my life. Absolutely. They lasted about 18 months apiece. But, yeah. wow, you know, if we have to be careful not to let our heart, like, get hardened like Pharaoh's heart and right. just keep saying, why, why, why am I not getting out of this now? Why am I not getting the answers I want now? You know, it's God's timing, you know, and he's got his reasons for having us go through that wilderness. Exactly. Did we read verse 8? I don't think we did. Nope. Nope, verse we eight. said Moses went down the mountain and told him. And verse 8 is, Then all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken we will do. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. So now Moses went up, he went down, now he's going back up. He's going back up. So he's <laughs> acting as an intermediary he's, at this point He's the in intercessor, time. right? Yeah, and we'll see, we'll see the significance of that here in just a minute. Okay, But the people like enthusiastically... Oh, wow. Okay. Be a, a, a special possession of God? Sounds good to me. Sign what, me up. Sign us up. What's, what are the... But watch. The terms of the covenant. One commentator put it very, very succinctly. Their answer was sincere, but it was ignorant. They had no clue what they were actually uh, uh, answering. Um, but Morgan goes on and he says... Even today, Morgan was, I think, from the 19th century. Um, he says, even so with us, we say, all that Jehovah hath spoken, we will do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we say, yeah, we'll do it. Yeah, what God says, heck, yeah, sign me up. I'll do it. And we fail. Mm -hmm. But God never fails. He waits and pursues his own uh, way of grace and government. So many times we enthusiastically answer, yes, sign me up. And we have no clue what that really means, what that really entails. So, yeah. So they enthusiastically answered yes at this point in time. Lori Hoyt. Hi, Hi Lori. Lori. Thanks for joining us. Verse 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will come to you in a thick cloud so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also trust in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the people to the Lord. Because you recall that frequently, it's only been three months, but frequently uh, when things aren't going well or when people think they aren't going well, what do they say? They, they tell Moses, they complain directly to Moses. Why did you bring us out here to die, to die of hunger, to die of thirst, to die by the hand of the Egyptians, to, to blah, 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 blah. So, mm -hmm. and God is saying, after after this, after this series of events here, people are going to know that you and I have a relationship and that you are speaking what I am telling you. Right. They're going to forget it. The people are going to forget it. Right. But it's of their own foolishness, not because there's any doubt that Moses 
isn't in relationship and communion uh, with God. So uh, God is going to appear on the mountain in a thick cloud to hide his holy presence. Okay. Then the Lord, verse 10, the Lord also said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their garments and have them ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So now he's instructing them. He's, he's saying, I'm coming. I will be, he's been in, he's, his presence has been there all along. But this is going to be uh, such a palpable presence that there'll be no denying. It's going to reveal more of that, his glory of and his more glory. of his presence. And he gives them three days to prepare. And he starts by saying, clean up. You've been wandering in the desert for three months. Clean up. And again, uh, knowing that there are several million people that need to wash their garments and wash their bodies, this is indicative of how much provision God is providing with the water streaming from the rocks. Okay, But he gives them three days. Verse 12. But you shall set boundaries for the people all around, saying, Beware that you do not go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall certainly be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall certainly be stoned or shot through. With an arrow is what it means. Whether animal or person, the violator shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up to the mountain. So... And again, a lot of critics are like, what is up with that? I mean, do people want to be close to God and they're going to get killed for it? Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Yes, because it, his holiness is beyond what we can. Right. His glory and his holiness is so pure and powerful. So we can't get close to, that close to it because we have sin. So he's instructing them and he's setting very, very, very clear boundaries uh, because at this point in history, they're not ready to approach God. They, we are sinners. We, we cannot approach God without the blood of Jesus over us today. Right. Joji says clean clothes means God instructed us to cleanse our souls by repentance from sins, to have a clean heart when we go to God. Absolutely. Yeah, the ap definitely the Absolutely. application today. It doesn't mean today like, you know, like you... You can worship God anywhere, anytime, but this is a special situation where right. God, again, is like teaching the Hebrew people who he is and how holy he is because they don't know, you know, they don't know what they don't know. It's like, you know, that's the way we are sometimes. Exactly. Like, they, we just don't know. So he's just teaching them because like Dan was saying, you know, we have a sin, sin nature right. and sin is in us. It's part of us. We can repent of our sins, of course. And we should um, always repent of our sins, and then we can be closer to the Lord. Right. But this is before Jesus died on the cross. So these any human being that gets too close to God is, is going to die from being too close to him because God is holy and fully righteous. Right, and that's what it means in, modern, in our modern terms to be washed by the blood of Jesus. Right. That blood cleanses us and allows a sinful people to be able to approach a holy God. Right. Um, Guzik put it this way. If there's anything basic to human nature is that we need boundaries. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In setting these boundaries and providing the death penalty for breaching them, God showed uh, Israel that obedience is more important than their feelings. Yeah, they may have been caught up in the euphoria and the thrill of actually being able to draw close to God, um, the God who's been providing for them. But God is making it clear, um, uh, boundaries, 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 obedience, obedience, obedience. Um, that's what he requires. And that's what's going to keep us safe, is to respect those boundaries that God sets before us. Verse 14. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. So they did as Moses instructed, and they begin the process. It's a three-day process. They begin by washing their garments. Now, does that mean that we can only approach God in clean clothes? Absolutely not. The right. thief on the cross was in no position to wash his garments, and yet Jesus said, this you, day you will be with me in paradise. Right, right. So after 
I mean, and and people like can talk to God in any in any state of cleanliness. Right. That's what we're saying. But um, these people just were going to get closer to God than ever right. before. And so it's a kind of a teaching lesson. It's a teaching lesson. Um, it's a that teaching they lesson. need to be, you know, preparing. Um, Guzik also said um, when I was listening to him, um, I liked his analogy. He said, you know, one of the applications of this for us today is that it's a good idea for us to prepare our hearts yeah. for Sunday or for our time of worship, whatever time gathering that may be. But like he was saying, you know, on Saturday night, you know, if you have kids that you always have to get ready and like I was thinking oh yeah there's so many you know stories and they're just it's funny because it's true like people are like it's chaos trying to get ready and get to church and you know bickering and arguing in the car and then you get out of the car and you walk onto the church property and you're like hey brother how are you oh am I right, fine everything's right. glorious you know um but all the way there in the morning it was chaos so right. I liked Guzik's analogy he said you know or application he said you know we should be spending Saturday night, you know, praying over our Sunday morning, getting the clothes picked out the night before and, you know, thinking through what, what we need to have ready for Sunday morning so that we can get up and come to the Lord and come to the, our, our time, our gathering of worship and learning the word together and not be um, distracted by all the chaos, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's a really good um, application, I think, that we could take away from what God's teaching the Israelites here. Yeah, and we have to be careful. We have to make the distinction. A true, God-fearing, Bible-believing, Jesus-worshipping Christian should never show up to church hungover. But somebody who doesn't know Jesus, who may be hungover, should be more than welcome at that church if they find Jesus. I mean, right. In if the they're whole, seeking the if Lord. They're seeking if they're the seeking, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to make that distinction. But at this point in history, right. God is saying, you need to clean up. You need to clean up your act. And then he goes even further. And we'll talk about this too. He also said, oh, I'm sorry, verse 15. Verse 15. He also said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman, which okay. just means do not have relations. It do not have mean... sexual relations. Okay. Right. So Hold the phone. Some people go like, oh, does God not value women, blah, 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 or women? Un no. Women are, no. No, 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 no. God does not see it that way. This, Remember, these people are coming from uh, evil religions right. that had cultic practices which involved sex frequently. There were temple prostitutes and right. there, were, there, were, there were aberrant sexual acts, quote, unquote, of worship, okay, which... which makes no sense at all but but so but they weren't worshiping the jehovah the one true living god right, they were just worshiping right. idols you so, know, so so this is instructing the people like gay was saying right to focus on god and god alone right. okay um guzik goes on and he says um he said he makes it very very clear the rest of scriptures do not teach that there is any inherent uncleanliness in sexual relations right I would add the caveat between a husband and a wife. Right. Within between the bounds of husband, marriage. Right. Within the bounds of marriage. Right. There is no uncleanliness in that. Right. This command was peculiar for this event, this event that the Hebrews were going to experience. In this situation, God wanted the people to demonstrate their desire for purity by putting on clean clothes and restraining uh, their, their, their desires even legitimate desires. Right. So this was a this was a specific event, and they were they, he wanted them to be focused and prepared and and ready to go. Right. Okay. So verse sixteen. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there were thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled, and Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Okay, and as we'll learn, there were very specific boundaries that they could not cross, but can you imagine? This was, um, this was a, a, using archaic language, this was a terrible, wonderful day. Mm -hmm. Terrible in the sense that it was, it was terrifying. Right. We are in the presence of God, and that His holiness is now being manifested through physical signs that would just absolutely terrify the people. Again, 
keeping in mind that, that uh, some of these people may have never seen a thunderstorm. They may never have seen a lightning storm. Except for the plague that was the Except for the hail, plague. And yeah. that, which was why that was so fearful and yeah. terrifying because of the plague that right. was the hail and the yeah, storm. Yeah, that may have been the only other right. time that they've seen something of this ilk, right? right? I mean, and that was Jehovah God bringing that. Bringing so. <laughs> that on, so yeah. Mm -hmm. But they, they're, they're, Moses is inviting them out of the camp to the base of the mountain. Verse 18, verse 18. So now Mount Sinai was all in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the entire mountain quaked violently, which is why I shared that song in the yeah. post right before this. <laughs> this was a, this was can a, you hear, a major Can you event. see the mountains tremble? I keep thinking about that song. Now, interestingly, some of the commentators said that, that um, the very few times that researchers have kind of snuck into Saudi Arabia, and or have been poking around in the Sinai Peninsula, that there is a mountain, that one particular mountain, especially the one in Saudi, um, there, there are places that are blackened as if they were, had been set on fire. Hmm. Okay, that's anecdotal, but that nonetheless, that, that's what they it's reported. It's intriguing, yeah. yeah. Verse 19. When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. Then the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So again, several million people are gathered around the base of this mountain, okay? And there's this overwhelming uh, cloud and lightning and, and, and what we describe as smoke and th uh, trumpet sound. And God uh, is descending in that. And we don't know, did the clouds light up in this glorious light? We don't know, but... Moses ascends into that cloud and the people are down at the base of the mountain. So verse 21, then the Lord spoke to Moses, go down, warn the people so that they do not break through to the Lord to stare and many of them perish. Again, these are an unfamiliar people. These are people unfamiliar with the holiness of God, the true holiness of right. God. And there may have been this temptation to run up and touch the mountain or, or right. run up and see what's above that cloud line to, where did moses go what's right. going on? if moses can do it i can do it i think this, this is why like he had moses already go up and down two or three times right i mean god's presence wasn't as far down on the mountain as it is right now but it's just interesting i think all that too was sort of like training you know for them to be like okay moses is going up he's going to come back down he's going up but now god's presence has come down and it's different it's a fully Full on, basically, kind of light show. Right. Um, and it's definitely very intense. So now God is saying, make sure you go down and tell them that they can't come up here. So I like Moses' response. And then they Verse 22. Him. And also the priests who approach the Lord consecrate, also have the priests who approach the Lord consecrate themselves or else the Lord will break out against them. This is a holy moment, unlike right. anything that's ever happened prior. Right. And so verse 23, and Moses says to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for you warned us, saying, set boundaries around the mountain and consecrate it. <laughs> I like Moses. He's like, dude, you told us. And so this is what I told them. Verse 24. Then the Lord said to him, go down and come up again, you and Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord, or he will break out against them. Again. So Moses, like, I already told him. And, I already told and, him. But, you know, so, like, who knows people better, God or Moses? I'm just saying. <laughs> so right. Moses is like, I already told him. God's like, I know. But you got to go tell him again. Right. And he's like, really? Again, <laughs> Guzik puts it this way. Those who, through rebellion, curiosity, or simple daring, presumed to go up on the mountain would perish. The glory and greatness of God wasn't uh, to be a matter subjected to scientific inquiry or a way to prove one one's own manhood. Right, you know, like the like, young guys are like, I dare you to go up there. I dare yeah, you to go up there. I dare you. I dare, I dare you, you to you. touch right. it. Or like the Nemo. I told him it was like the Nemo movie, no, the very the first one. Yeah. yeah, don't touch the boat. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Verse 25. <laughs> Didn't work out so well for no, little Nemo. No. He went and touched the boat, remember? Anyway, you'll have to rewatch it. Verse 25, so Moses went down to the people and told them. So he does. God says, that, yes, I know, Moses. I know you get this. Do this anyway. Be obedient do this verse 25 um, and then that's it yeah then this commentary 
many people, many today, many people today feel we need to get uh, more of the thunder and fire and trembling of Mount Sinai into people as a way of keeping them from sin. The idea is like, if you knew God, if you saw God like this, if you could see the mountains tremble and the, and the, and the fire and the sky, and, and then that would turn you from sin. Judge, you yeah. said, thunder is the voice of God and lightning is the fire of God, ways to engage the attention of people. True. That is true. That is mm -hmm. absolutely right. true. Yet, yet, uh, Guz, or one of the commentators says, yet not 40 days from this wondrous sight, this once-in-a-lifetime event, not 40 days later, the whole nation would have an orgy around a golden calf. Right. Praising it as a God, the God that brought them out of Egypt. Uh, so after this, they make the golden calf. Like, really? Right. So, interesting. Right. So, so just... Hebrews 12, 18 is where you got next. Uh, yeah. So, um, so... How does this relate to our, 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 our situation, our, our uh, uh, Christianity um, after Jesus, after the cross, after Calvary? Okay, how does it relate? Well, Hebrews 12 gives us a, a very, very good um, footing, uh, idea of how to approach this, okay? Um, and so in, in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 18, the scripture tells us, you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire. For you have not come to a mountain that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind and to the blast of a trumpet and the sound of words which sound was such uh, that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. So Hebrews is recounting this event and he goes on in verse 19, whoops, uh, verse 20. For they could not cope with the command. If even an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. Okay. And again, terrible here meaning overwhelming and awe-filling. Like awe-inspiring. Yeah, awe, yeah. yeah. Filled okay. with awe, not right, that, that right. kind of terrible. Uh, verse 22. But if you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the myriad of angels to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven into God, the judge of all, and to protect the spirits of the righteous made perfect. We had Mount Sinai, but we as modern believers have Mount Zion, have Calvary, okay? Uh, and we have Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. This is where we stand. So... Mm -hmm. To try and say, oh, we just need to have that, 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 that Mount Sinai event. That would get people to come to God. Well, we have a new covenant, and it's the blood of the Lamb. It's the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for, the, for your shed blood, which cleanses us and makes us righteous. And, and, and we don't need to stand and, and look at a mountain that's quaking and, 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 and on fire. Uh, we just need to look to that empty cross to that empty tomb, to that shed blood, and to know that we, we are made righteous because of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So some of the couple of the commentators I listened to, um, I just thought it was interesting. They went ahead and looked at the beginning of chapter 20. Um, so because right after verse 25 of, of chapter 19, Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. The beginning of verse, uh, chapter 20, it says, Then God gave the people all these instructions. And then the Ten Commandments are listed in quotes. These are the words of God. And what's really interesting is so the people, this isn't where he wrote them down yet on the stone tablets. This is God speaking and all the people are audibly hearing the Ten Commandments from the words, from the mouth of God himself. So I just thought, wow, a lot of the several commentators went went there so just as a precursor or a little teaser for what we're going to get into next week what a right? day what a day though. praise what the lord you know what a imagine. god we serve what a god we serve amen 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 so, well thanks you guys for being with us thank you well thank you all for all your kind words and text messages thanks and, for and all your yeah and, your condolences and yeah. everything for so, it's been a whirlwind um month we had in month. may so we're yeah. looking forward to maybe a calmer june but we don't know we don't know just depends what the Lord wants us to do. But what we do know is that God is with us. Whatever come may, may come, 
we can say it is well with our souls. Praise the Lord. Because we serve a risen Savior. Amen. Our God is all. a holy God. <laughs> Good night. See you all next week.